This is really, the night's been fabulous, but this is what I've been waiting for. To take us into the next stanza of the evening, would you please welcome my dear friend of, well, it's gotta be nearly 40 years, Mike, 35 years, something like that. I love this guy. He was a wonderful cricket journalist, has been a wonderful author of books, and is a very passionate person about the LBW Trust. Would you please welcome Mike Coward. You're in great form, Michael Roy. For one entering their 60th year, you're in wonderful form. Well done, well done. Got to have a sledge, got to have a sledge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and as ever, it's a, a joy to be with you. And it is a particular pleasure tonight to introduce a consummate professional, perhaps the ultimate professional of the glorious game, Sir Richard Hadley. The first cricketer to be knighted while still playing, Richard was the first bowler to 400 test wickets and for a time the greatest wicket taker in the annals of test cricket. One of the incomparable four all-rounders who bestrode the game in the 1980s, Richard took 431 test wickets at a miserly 22.29, the 431st from the final ball of his 86th and last test match. On nine occasions, he took 10 or more wickets in a match and a startling 36 times returned five or more wickets in an innings. His 15 for 123 against Alan Borders Australians at Brisbane in 1985 stands as one of the greatest of all bowling achievements. Just seven bowlers have taken more wickets in a test career and only four have worked from a long run. Glenn McGrath, Courtney Walsh, Kapildev and Jimmy Anderson. And to this end, it's worth noting the seven bowlers ahead of him played between 131 and 145 test matches. That's a staggering 45 to 59 more tests than Richard played. The most guileful of all bowlers for much of his career, Richard alone carried the hopes of his country. Indeed, he's responsible, and this is the most startling figure, he is responsible for a remarkable 34.34% of New Zealand's wickets while he was playing. That is remarkable. A non-song, he could be a devastatingly effective batsman. More than 3,000 test runs at 27 with two centuries and 1550s attest to this. And for good measure, for Nottinghamshire, he accomplished the fabled double, 100 wickets and 1,000 runs in a season. One of five sons born to Walter Hadley, who captained New Zealand in eight matches from 1946 to 1951. Richard showed remarkable durability, retiring at the age of 39 in 1990. And like his father before him, Richard continued to serve New Zealand cricket as chairman of selectors and as a director and vital member of the High Performance Advisory Group, which till today is driving New Zealand cricket. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Richard Hadley. Off a shorter run these days, that, but that was still impressive. A very short run. <laughs> it's good to see you, as always. What does it mean coming back to this famous old ground, the, the Sydney Cricket Ground, but still with its stand, the lady stand and the member stand, and of course the place where you had one of your early fifers, what, how many years, 32 years ago now? Yeah, special memories, always to come back to one of the great cricket grounds uh, in the world. Uh, my first uh, memories of the SCG, 1974, a test match we should have won, but of course the rain came for about a day and a half with Australia two for 33 in the second innings, chasing 400, so we were deprived <laughs> uh, of, uh, of victory. Um, Funny but how those facts just roll off the tongue. Yes, yeah. And I had both those wickets too, actually. So, <laughs> so I was actually looking for another five for wit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, 74 was um, my first time. A scary moment actually, coming to famous grounds and when you're only 23 years of age 
and on your first tour of Australia, um, it was 73 actually, because we beat you yeah. in 74 back in New Zealand. I thought I'd just get yes, that. Yes, I might get to that. Yeah. And then I came back, uh, and that was in 85, mm. played uh, the test match here, which Australia won. Uh, we were 1 0 up after the Gabba test. It was 1 all here, then we went to Perth and uh, won that to win the series for the first time in Australia. So I thought I'd get that one in as well. Yeah, I thought that um, it's very early. We're fine. Yeah, but I played a lot of one-day games here. But th when, when I look at stadiums today and we look at the SCG, we now look at the Adelaide Oval, uh, look, I understand progress has to be made and the stadia is about corporatisation and having comfort uh, for spectators and that sort of thing. But there's just something, say, with this ground, where is the hill? In Adelaide Oval, where is the greenery? Yeah. Uh, the old Gabba ground, the dog track around it. I mean, those sorts of magical moments are now gone. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, we must look to the future and we have what we have now and it, and it is magnificent. The Hadley name, of course, is as synonymous with New Zealand cricket as the chapel name is with Australian cricket. Uh, and I would have thought at times it must be a difficult name to live with or live up to. Were there challenges as you were growing up? I mean, with, with Dale and yourself leading the New Zealand attack. What did Walter say to you? What did Dad say to you as you were growing into the game? Well, I think the thing I remember most, uh, what my father said, and of course, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, Walter, Dad, uh, did captain New Zealand. Uh, we do come from a cricketing family, so we had all the help, the guidance, the equipment to play the game, the encouragement to play it. And the biggest thing that stood out for me is that uh, he said, Richard, Whatever you do, take pride in your performance and do it to the best of your ability, even if somebody does it better. But if you give 100%, then no one can ever criticise. So when you sort of have those sorts of words in the back of your mind all the time, uh, it's just something that uh, can drive you. But the great thing about coming from the Hadley family, yes, there are five boys, four of us played cricket and three of us actually played for New Zealand. Mm in the 75 World Cup. My older brother Barry was an opening batsman. Of course, Dale played 28 test matches. We played a lot of cricket together. We encouraged each other at first class and international level. But the big thing about having a father like Walter Hadley, he spent 70 of his 91 years devoted to cricket in New Zealand and New Zealand cricket. Because he was not only a captain, a player, he was a manager, a selector. He was on the board of New Zealand cricket. He was chairman of New Zealand cricket. He was our ICC delegate, a life member. No person in the history of our game has given greater service uh, to cricket uh, than, uh, than Walter Hadley. And, and so when you come from the Hadley family, there's a lot to live up to. There yeah. are a lot of expectations. And if I can tell just a little story about Dad, 1951, captaining New Zealand against England, and uh, Cyril Washbrook was the opening batsman for England, and he was given out to a, a very bad decision, an LBW decision. He had hit the ball onto, uh, onto the pads, not out, but he was given out. And Dad was at mid-off, and as Cyril walked back to the pavilion, he passed Dad, and Dad said, Cyril, did you hit that ball? And he says, yes, I did. Wait here. So Dad went up to the umpire and said, we want to withdraw our appeal and recall the batsman. Now, Cyril was given out at six at that occasion. He was recalled and went on to score 56. In Dad's mind, he said, our conscience is clear because we did the right thing. Mm. And I think that is a tremendous value. Yeah. And uh, again, those sorts of things are very, very powerful and stay with you. Now, I was born in 1951, so I knew nothing about this, but I heard this story later on. And I think that's the way the Hadley family has uh, really lived our lives. It's interesting to linking the chapel and the Hadleys as I did in the introduction. <coughs> um, of course, there is the Hadley Chapel trophy. Well, can I just correct you? It's the, cha it's the Hadley Chapel. Not the uh, Chapel uh, Hadley. In New Zealand. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. It's yeah. interesting how it alternates across the ditch, isn't it? <laughs> um, and it's an interesting one because it's for the one-day game. And, of course, 37 years ago, on February the 1st, one of our patrons of the LBW Trust, Greg Chappell, took a particular decision. 
and asked his brother to bowl the underarm. Well, was that February 1st, 1981, MCG at 5.42 p.m.? Something about, yeah, about yeah, that, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Was that and what you're and I think Robert, to? And Robert Muldoon was still your Prime Minister, I think. I, as I can remember, his sledge was as good as any of them. Yes. Yeah. What well, he said, actually, Rob Muldoon, our Prime Minister with the underarm incident, said it was appropriate the Australians were dressed in yellow. Yes. <laughs> it was an act of cowardice, he said. He didn't miss, did he? Yeah, he did. He, he did yeah. not miss. Yeah. Has, has Chapel been forgiven? Oh, of course. Look, um, uh, it was one of those things that happened. And, of course, if, if we're going to reminisce a little bit about the, the incident... Um, it was in the rules of one day cricket. You could bowl the underarm ball, but of course what was challenged afterwards was the spirit of the game. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Greg would probably regret it um, years later. And uh, look, every time I see Greg, look, we're fine. When he comes to New Zealand, he's fine. Um, perhaps I can just point out that in 1930, there was the, the, um, the body line series. 32-3. Right? Yeah, yep. okay, there was the body line series. And then there was the Packer series in 76, 77, 77 78. Uh, then umpire Daryl here, no ball, merely out of the game yeah. for, for chucking. Yeah. And then there was the underarm incident. Isn't it strange how all those incidents happened in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is it about Australia and the history of the game and these controversial this moments? Con this the tumult. But it does get me to a point, as provocative as you are in this mood, that... Australia treated New Zealand cricket shabbily for a long, long time. Um, and I think there's regrets in this country about that. I mean, the first test match wasn't until... I mean, we played... Uh, in fact, Bill Brown was yes. captain against your father yes. in 1946. Yeah, 45, 46. 45, 46. Australia and then it wasn't officially declared a test match for another 18 months or two years. That's correct. And then we didn't formally play until you played in 70, 73. I mean... Uh, did, did the New Zealand cricket community resent that? Well, I think we did. Uh, we felt that Australian cricket should have done uh, a lot more for New Zealand cricket. Uh, to be fair, though, what Australia did, they sent, uh, like, a B team out to New Zealand. Mm. Uh, there was a Les Favel team, yeah, a Sam, Sam Tribble team. team. Yeah. A young Dennis Lilly came out to yeah. New Zealand in, what, early 1970, somewhere around there. And so we did have contact with Australia at a different level. And they were unofficial... Uh, sort of test matches when New Zealand played uh, against those particular teams. So we're playing against Australians at the end of their career and some young players uh, be starting their career. So it was still a good, good contest. But the fact that there was 27 years before uh, we renewed our uh, mm -hmm. test match relationships was far too long. And then uh, we came here in 73, we lost the series. Australia came back to us in 74. We won at Christchurch when Glenn Turner scored 100 in each innings and uh, it, it was nice to get off the mark and beat Australia for the first time. Uh, but since then, the relationships, and certainly now the relationship between New Zealand and Australia is exceptional. Yeah. The contact that we have, the content of games, test matches, 50 over T20 games, is at its best. And I think that relationship will just get stronger and stronger. And that's going to benefit our game greatly. And I think those trans-Tasman relationships in any sport, whether it be netball, rugby, league, has got to be good uh, for both countries. So uh, in cricket, we'd like to see more of it. It does seem, though, that, you, that the black caps are often marginalised by the All Blacks. The All Blacks are such a remarkable sporting body that it seems as though they consume all the sort of sporting energy in New Zealand. Is that fair, or has cricket still got an identity? Well, I think you've got to remember that rugby's our national game, cricket yeah. is our summer game. And there's a lot of tradition and history and expectation with the All Blacks, and they are the best in the world, have been for a long time. They don't lose many games. Uh, when they do, it's a, it's a national disaster. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're expected to win. For cricket, uh, we're going through a pretty good time, uh, really, in yeah. New Zealand cricket over the last few years. But cricket and other sports will always live in the shadow of, uh, of rugby. But we are a very demanding country with all our sports people uh, in anything that we do now because the All Blacks have set such a bar that others are now got to try and uh, live up to it. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. In fact, media and public on sports people can be uh, harsh, great critics. You talked about 44 years ago and just your sixth test match, you were a member of the first team to defeat uh, Australia by five wickets at Lancaster Park. Well, the sadness there, of course, 
with Lancaster Park. It is no longer. Uh, it never recovered from the earthquake, which is a, a run of the sadness because it was a, a wonderful ground. Um, but you and Dale, between you, took 12 wickets in that test match. I mean, you must look back on that with enormous satisfaction. I had no idea how many wickets my brother got. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. contributed, he uh, contributed. Yeah, I, I don't know, I might have got three in one innings and four in another, so did he get five? I think it was eight and four. No, yeah. Eight and four, was it? Yeah. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Yes. <laughs> 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 well, look, you know, when you're playing Australia... Uh, in any sport, I mean, they're the, they're the ones you want to beat, perhaps more than, than anyone else. And, and to get across the line on that occasion, I mentioned Glenn Turner scoring a hundred yeah, in each innings, innings there, yeah. a remarkable performance. Australia were probably underpowered in the pace department, I think, in that game because there was no Lily, Tomo wasn't really on the scene. I, I think Jeff Dimmick might have opened the bowling, yeah. Greg Chappell did a bit of bowling. Kerry O'Keefe, mm. uh, and or there might have been or oh, Jeff Hurst. I think he might have might have played. But anyway, it um, it wasn't a strong, Victoria, strong yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Australian side really. Strong batting side, but not necessarily a strong yeah. bowling, bowling side. side. Mm. Getting back to your father just briefly, I wonder what advice he imparted to you to to cope with public expectation, but to to uh, to cope with being a public figure as he had been. Oh, I think being a public figure, you know, it, it is pretty tough. The expectations are there. Look, I reckon it's very, very tough on sports people today because of social media. Yeah. You know, with cameras on phones and all sorts of things. And you've just got to watch your P's and Q's and anything that you're doing these days. Far harder for players today to get away with anything. Uh, and our day it was, was very, very different. But there were still expectations as a sports person um, to do the right thing, to show respect, show courtesy, give your best, to train hard, to prepare well uh, and leave no stone unturned as far as preparation is concerned. And, and Dad was pretty pretty tough on that. If you can't be a cricketer, at least look like a cricketer, dress like a cricketer. Uh, I, I remember when I was captain of the school first 11 at Christchurch Boys High School, because I'd come from a cricketing background, uh, I effectively demanded that the first 11 should turn up to practice in their whites after school. Now, you never get that happening today, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't think. But I just thought that was the sort of etiquette and standard and tradition that should be upheld. And uh, they're part of the strong values of the game. And um, so those sorts of things have always stuck with me. Which brings us to the point, are the, because of the short forms of the game and the popularity, uh, are some of those values and virtues being devalued, as it were. Oh, I, don't, I don't know about that. I mean, there's always a lot of talk about sledging, and, and Australia are quite good at that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> years and years of practice and great role models have actually passed on the art of uh, sledging. Look, I call it banter. I think banter's good value for the game. I have no problem with that. You can have a lot of fun and some very funny quips out there at time to time. You cross the line, of course, you know, when you um, become verbally abusive, you question somebody's parentage and you're swearing and cursing, not accepting decisions and that sort of thing, you cross the line, you pay a price uh, for that. Um, but I think when you look at Test cricket, 50 over cricket, T20 cricket, all three have got to coexist. They've got to live together these days. Now, I am a traditionalist. Test cricket will always be the ultimate game because it's a test. It's a test of your mental, physical, technical, tactical, game changes, all sorts of things, weather, pitch conditions, match situations. That's what the test is about and how you've got to adapt and try and wear people down over a period of five days. And that game must be protected, and I'll do all I can uh, to do that. The 50-over game we need because of World Cups and revenue. The T20 certainly got a part uh, to play, but it's not real cricket. It is a form of cricket, mm. but not real cricket. Uh, and the players today, and this, this is quite a bold statement, I, I'm saying really because of the T20 cricket and how the players have got to be innovative, creative, a high risk sort of game, the players today are far more skillful than the players of yesteryear because they have to be. And uh, in simple terms, I had two slower balls when I bowled uh, in, in my artillery. Now you see fast bowlers with four or five different fi uh, slower balls in their armoury. And you've got to execute those skills. You miss by a small margin, you're going out of the park. So these guys, they work hard on their skill sets. I'm not saying they're better players. I'm saying they're more skillful yeah. because of the, uh, 
how you've got to adapt to different forms of the game. And I, quite frankly, I think it's very hard for players to play in all three formats and do it well. And I think we're starting to see, and Australia have done this very recently with the very new look T20 side, mm. who are world class, by the way. And I think some of the test players might start um, sort of specialising more in the test format and you get these new, fresh players coming in, uh, making an impact. And I think that's good for the, the game. It creates more job opportunities, gives more players an opportunity to represent their country in whatever form they're good enough. I think that's good value. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a very progressive view. Was this, is that the line that you took consistently with the advisory committee of the New Zealand board? Well, when T20 first came along, I thought this is going to be so destructive for the game of cricket. It's going to butcher the game uh, in, the, in a very harsh sense. Uh, but what I've seen from it now, look at Caters for a different sort of spectator. A game in three and a half hours, great for television, great atmosphere at the grounds, big crowds, family, economical to get into the grounds. Um, and it's value for money, it's entertainment. And uh, look, I watch the IPL, I watch the Big Batch, I, I, I watch the T20 internationals, and I enjoy it. But we must look after the test game, and it appears at the moment that the test cricket game might be suffering around the world. It's sad not to see the West Indies competitive, mm. really, in test cricket. They were magnificent in the 70s and 80s, a joy to watch, uh, but now they're players are focusing more on the T20 and the, the 50 over games and that to me is a bit sad when they're not available to represent their country in test cricket and, and, and that's really one of the negative things that happen is that players are retiring prematurely from international sport to go and play in these domestic leagues around the world. It's, it's sad for you and, and me not to see these guys playing at the highest level a lot longer than they are. You talked about the pressures in social media today. I go back to a time in your life when it was tough, in the early 1980s, when you talked quite openly about depression. You then ran into trouble with your heart. Um, and I think it's interesting now because so much public discussion about uh, mental health issues with elite sportsmen. In some ways, you were amongst the first to talk publicly and openly about it, which I think was a help for a lot of people in that period. But we're now talking 30 years ago. I mean, does it concern you now? We've seen Troscopic, we've seen others, we've seen a two or three in, South, in New South Wales over the last two years. Young boys, Moses Enriquez this year, Nick Madison last year. And it worries me as an observer from the outside of, of the impact it's having, the amount of cricket, the pressures, the expectations. How, how are you viewing it for somebody who went through it all those years ago? Well, it's a very difficult thing. I had my problems 1982, 1983. I found the biggest thing for me is I couldn't say no, and that there were requests for me to go up and down the country, appear here, there and everywhere. I played in a charity game, got a bit of heat stroke, had a few heart palpitations, had dizzy spells, blurred vision, and so they're very much physical uh, symptoms. And then all of a sudden, mentally, I was starting to struggle. I was very negative about uh, things. I was losing the will to want to, to play and train for the game of cricket. I couldn't even run a lap of the park and just wanted to give cricket away. And this is six months out from a series against England that was, uh, was going to happen. And trivial things started to dominate me. I mean, uh, a crooked picture on the wall had to be straightened. You know, a dead fly on the floor had to be picked up. And I remember my, uh, my first wife um, taking me out uh, for a drive and after three or four minutes I said, look, uh, take me back home. I don't want to be out in the public. I don't look good, I don't feel good, I'm negative, I'm depressed. And when you go through that, it's a very dark place. And people can be in it for a long period of time. And this is all related to pressure and expectations. I mean, playing sport... Uh, you've got your own pressure and expectations. You've got the crowd, you've got the media, you've got the match situations. Uh, and all these things can eat away at you. And sometimes you just need to walk away and ask for help and advice. So I went through that period where I asked for help and advice and was able to turn it around in four or five months. It was a difficult job. And uh, in fact, I remember my father saying to the New Zealand cricket selectors, you won't have Richard. You won't have him for this home series against England in 1983. Well, fortunately, I was able to pick myself up through seeking advice, talking to people, 
and uh, I played in that test series and did pretty well. I, me I remember getting 99 at Lancaster Park and England didn't get uh, 80 in each innings. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and I got a few wickets. But that, that triggered my revival, if you like. Uh, I just lacked the confidence and belief. And it's not unusual for sports people, high-profile high people to be faced with that. Uh, and the sooner you can get out of it, the better, but you can't do it yourself. Is there a presumption that because you're playing at the very top that they are self-sufficient, like looking around at the, uh, at the elite players today, and they're under enormous pressure, a lot of them, that they are able to, to withstand it all? But well, that's not always the case, is it? Yeah, but I remember going back to my time, there was just me having to handle, handle yeah. the situation. There wasn't the support yeah. that you see in sporting teams today. That's now, true. Gosh, I mean, a cricket team has got another 11 I know. that are supporting them. Yeah. You know, and rugby, there's probably another 15 that are supporting them in the way of, uh, mm. you know, trainers and mental skills people and uh, technical people and coaches, all sorts of things. So they should be able to help them. Uh, they will recognise, uh, pick the symptoms for their players when they're not in good shape mentally mm. or, uh, or physically and get them help. Before we get on to one, the, <coughs> the, the project you've been on in the recent years and you've enjoyed so much, you're always linked. There were the four great all-rounders of the period, Botham, Kapil Dev, and the, the uh, perhaps president of Pakistan to be Imran Khan. What relationship did you have with them and how much did you admire them and how conscious of their deeds were you and were you always striving to beat them? Oh, I think the battle of the all-rounders in the 80s was a magnificent time to be playing the game of cricket. Uh, there was always the will and the desire to outdo your opponents. So if you were bowling to Beefy or Emmy or, or Capel, you wanted to get them out. If you were batting against them, uh, you didn't want to get out to them. And yes, we were conscious of other people's performances. I mean, with the way media is today, you can just flick of the button, you, you can find out anywhere in the world what somebody's doing. But we had to read newspapers to know that Beefy's just got five wickets against India today and he's got, a, got an 80 or 100. We knew what our, each other's stats were. And I was motivated a lot by statistics and I was criticised for that. But whatever it takes to motivate you to get out there and perform and get the desired results, if it's statistics or whatever it may be, goals or, you know, so be it. And um, on the field of play, we were at each other. No question about it. Off the field of play, in fact, what I would say to qualify that is that when, you get, when you're out of the game, and I've been out of it now for, what, 28, 29 years, and you get to come to functions like this, and you see my old nemesis uh, wit over there, and sometimes you see a lot of other cricketers, you get on far better when you're out of the game than when you were playing it, because there's nothing to prove anymore. What has gone on in the past, it's done and dusted, the record is there, it doesn't matter, and you get to have a chat and a beer and a meal and reminisce, you know, that, that's the continuation of a, a sporting career and that's something I really enjoy. So when I come across the others, um, it's, it's good to catch up. Definitely. So you enjoy the fellowship of the game perhaps more as a former player yeah, than when you're playing? Absolutely. That's interesting. Yeah. In fact, we've got to tell the story about Whit, don't we? Yeah, well, we'll for, get for, to those, for those <laughs> for those who don't know, you know, in 1987, um, Australia were 1 0 up in the series. And uh, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> Australia were 1 0 up in the series, and we needed to win the final test at the MCG to square the series but retain the Trans Tasman Trophy because we were, we were the holders. At tea time on the last day, Australia were going to win. Uh, but after tea, things started to happen. We picked up some early wickets, and to cut a long story short, uh, with the last over to go, Mike Whitney, um, I bowled the last over to him. And when I saw Whit walk out to bat carrying a bat, I thought, that's strange. <laughs> with an average of five, you know, I didn't think he'd need it. But... Um, but anyway, I had to bowl the last over to him and I thought, now if I bowl it straight, he's going to miss it or he's going to get hit on the pad LBW. So I bowled during those six balls, three balls that he blocked out and three balls that he played and missed at. And he survived to the roar of the crowd because he had just done something special for Australia. 
And I went up to him and I put my hand uh, on his helmet and uh, my arm around his shoulder and said, tremendous work, congratulations, you've just done something special for Australia. For Australia. And Ian Smith, our wicketkeeper, went up to Witt and gave him the cricket ball as a token or something to remember the, the game for. And I said, hang on, Smith, that's my ball. I've just got five wickets. What, you, and you're giving it to Witt. And uh, <laughs> Witt had it for 27 years <laughs> and saw the light. And just a few years ago at a function, rather emotionally for both of us, he presented the ball to me, which I now have uh, back home in New Zealand. <laughs> now... I just think that typerate, uh, uh, typifies the respect, the friendship and camaraderie between one player and another and one country and another. And uh, I, I hold you in the highest regard, mate, and uh, really appreciate that gesture. It was something uh, very, very special, so well done. I think in, in fairness, and Witt wouldn't mind me pointing it out too, that that afternoon you bowled unchanged from 5.17 until the finish at 6.49. You equaled Ian Botham's then world record of 373 wickets and finished with match figures of 10 for 176 from 75 overs. So and you, thankfully you did get the ball back eventually. Yeah, it was, it was actually quite a big effort really. <laughs> <laughs> Bowl 30 overs in the last day and to try and knock wit over. That is my most embarrassing moment in my career that I couldn't get him out. <laughs> Batting average of five. But you survived six balls, so um, did, uh, you didn't score any runs. <laughs> and of course, that was a, at a time when the Australian crowds were sort of, uh, what would we say, giving you a fairly tough time, making sort of references to, was it being a, a banker? Yeah, well, funny, when I retired from cricket, I, I did go into the banking business. <laughs> Because every time I played cricket here in Australia, they were saying that uh, Hadley's a banker. Uh, was that right? Something like that. Well, I couldn't understand whether it was a <laughs> W or a B, but it, it was I was called many things over here. It was a mark of respect, apparently, <laughs> uh, uh, which I felt that was very strange. I think, didn't, <laughs> in fact, didn't Greg Chappell at one stage say to you, try and embrace the crowds a bit more? That be, Yes. There was tension, yes, wasn't it, between yes. you? Yeah. I, well, I, as a youngster, yeah, yeah. a relative youngster, I tended to overreact a little bit to the crowd reactions here, which is something that I shouldn't have done, and Greg did remind me of that. But I do recall another little incident when we came here, probably um, in mid-'80s, I guess it was, and we are playing a game at Geelong, and a fella called Peter Oxlade, a left-handed opening batsman mm. playing for Victoria Country, batted all day like Jeffrey Boycott for about 90 not out. And he'd frustrated us, uh, and particularly me as a new ball bowler, all day. And I bounced him towards the end of the day and unfortunately fouled him, uh, hit him in the head. You, you don't deliberately want to do these things, I can assure you. You, you know, you, you want to intimidate, but you don't want to hit or injure people. And he went to the ground and they carried him off. And it was effectively the end of the day's play. And a young fella came up to me and he called me a mongrel. He must have been about 12, 14 years of age. And I chased him. And uh, I caught him. And I <laughs> gave him a bit of a dressing down. Now, you shouldn't be saying these things. Look, I'm a, I'm a visitor you, to your country. And if I was a, a little bit older, you know, you might have got a whack around the backside sort of thing. And uh, next morning, uh, several helicopters flew in, Channel 9, Channel 10, <laughs> Channel 7, all wanting an interview. And rather foolishly, I did this interview. And I said, um, look, I'm very disappointed with the reaction of this kid. He shouldn't have done that. Uh, his language wasn't very good. And I'm sure the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, Bob Hawke, would not be happy to... Uh, <laughs> to hear all this sort of uh, stuff, which was the worst thing that I could have done because I had to come back here to the SCG and the MCG, you know, the Hill, Bay 13, and I copped it <laughs> a lot harder thereafter. So sometimes it pays to just shut up. <laughs> but that's probably when the banker began. Yes, that's right. Now, tell us about this project. Um, it's been interesting. I've seen the book. Um, it's the work. Your father kept a very detailed... That's actually it. This is it. The it's diary uh, of, he led New Zealand to England in 1949. And this is something you and your, your brothers were intent on doing? 
Well, it's something that I wanted. I don't know whether you can actually see that close up, but it's a day-to-day -day diary of the eighth month's tour, and it's a four-year project, actually, and th this is very much an historical document. Um, uh, and it's a very unusual project, and I think I'd stand corrected, but I think nothing like this has ever been done before, where you get the captain's day-to-day -day diary of a tour as detailed and in-depth as it is, personal feelings and insights, I mean, it's just after the war, Europe was rebuilding. It's about all the games, the functions that they went to. Um, and then produce a two-hour DVD documentary on the tour to complement the book uh, makes it a very special project. And I'm on record as saying that whatever I have done in the game of cricket, whatever I have achieved on the field of play and my involvement with cricket, this is my greatest lifetime achievement in bringing this story to life through my father's writings uh, and through that DVD documentary with player interviews, live archive, film footage. Uh, these guys were pioneers in our game and they were known as the 49ers and no other team in the history of New Zealand cricket are named after the year in which they played. And uh, they set the standard and gave us credibility and respect as a cricket playing nation. And the biggest thing that they did was that uh, they went unbeaten in the Test Series and to draw against England uh, was a pretty good effort mm. uh, because previous tours had lost money, they'd lost series. Our credibility was on the line. They drew all four Test matches. And straight after that tour, the MCC granted New Zealand four-day Test match status because we were competitive. And the other thing was for the first time, uh, and this being the fourth tour of England, the tour made a profit nearly £17,000, which in today's money equates to about a million dollars. And a million dollars coming into New Zealand cricket coffers way back in 1949 guaranteed future New Zealand tours home and away. And money was distributed to the major and district associations which allowed those associations or unions to grow the game. That's what these guys did. And they have to be remembered forever. And so to produce... Uh, uh, Dad's diary uh, into the skipper's diary uh, is, a, is an achievement that I'm extremely proud of and uh, no matter what happens, it's now there forever and uh, it will be protected. Yeah, well, These congratulations, that I can see mm. that <coughs> means so much to you. And for the passionate cricket people here, it's the, the book is on sale tonight, later, you'll be happy to sign and chat to any of those who uh, would like to take it away. It is a magnificent and a substantial book. It is a sub well, it's 514 pages. There are 150 photographs of 1949, very well uh, reproduced. and uh, It's a social history, really, isn't it? Well, it's more than a cricket book. It's yeah. about the life and times of 49. As I say, after the war, Europe rebuilding, uh, a lot of negativity around strikes, um, rationing, and, and these sorts of things. So uh, um, it's, it's, it's a story. Yeah. And uh, as I say, it's got a... The precious it's story of... Being, being told. Uh, remarkable. Yeah. Well, it's been wonderful having you back over this side of the ditch. I know that you'll be available later in the night for those who might like to uh, get a copy of the Skipper's Diary. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Sir Richard Hadley. Thank you.